Diese Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. Okay, the conference is now being recorded. Um, so, yeah, I will just I will just close the mic for uh, the Q&A session so we can have a more informal um, informal debate later on. Um, okay, this is from me now. So I will just leave the floor to uh, Izumi. Thank you again so much for making this possible. Okay, thank you, Malta. Good evening to those of you who are joining in from Asia. And good morning to those of you who are in Europe. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Is it okay? So uh, thank you for attending the webinar, Archiving for Nuclear Decommissioning, Challenges and Collaboration today. I'm Izumi Hirano. I'm an archivist at the Research Center for Cooperative Civil Societies at Rikkyo University, Tokyo. And I am going to co-host this event. But I'm not really confident with my English, so I'd like to ask everyone to help me when you see me stuck for words. So first of all, let me tell you how this webinar came about. On the 30th of June this year, I attended the webinar on the same topic organized by Eogan Energy Archives Network, titled The Nuclear Decommissioning Authority in Britain, Long-Term Preservation of Records and the Development of the Rapid Assessment Model. It was a great webinar, but as I listened to the speakers, I felt really ashamed of my ignorance on the topic as an archivist in Japan. As you all know, we had a severe nuclear accident in Fukushima 10 years ago after the great earthquake. And we have many nuclear facilities which have been and are to be decommissioned. But I realized at the webinar in June that I knew absolutely nothing about how records of decommissioning were being made and preserved in Japan. I also saw the significant significance of the topic of nuclear archives for all the people living in the global civil society in the 21st century. So I contacted Marta, the president of Irgan and the chair of the June event, to ask if she and other speakers would be interested in copying the event for our Asia Pacific audience. She said yes and kindly started contacting the speakers, but somehow we lost contact when the summer vacation came. <laughs> then we resumed exchanging emails in October, and I was amazed by the way Marta arranged everything in such a speed. So I would like to thank Marta for making this happen. Without you, it wouldn't have happened. And also thank all the speakers uh, for their cooperation and commitment. So today we have four great speakers. I think all the speakers are on video. So the first I would have uh, Kolya Abramsky say hi, Kolya, <laughs> to the audience uh, from George Padmore Institute representing Eogan today will talk about Yogan and issues related to energy and records and archives to put this webinar into broader context. Then Martin Robb, say hi Martin. <laughs> uh, Martin Robb from the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority will tell us about what NDA is and what it does. And Gordon Reed, where's Gordon? Yeah, Gordon Reed, archivist at Nuclear and Caithness Archives, will show us how he manages the NDA records. And the last but not least, Jenny Mitchum from Digital Preservation Coalition. Hi, where, where are you, Jenny? Yeah, Hello. yeah we'll introduce <laughs> DPC Rapid Assessment Model, uh, which was developed by the collaboration of her organization and NDA. I suggest, as Martha, that you use chat for comments and questions during the preservation and then, yeah, presentation. And it might also be a nice idea to use chat to briefly introduce yourself so that you can contact each other after the event. So you say hi and your name and affiliation and email address and then send to everyone if you feel okay about that. And before we start, there's one more thing I would like to point out, especially to the participants who are not records professionals. Uh, we all know that nuclear decommissioning is a very complicated process with many different stakeholders involved. That means the process creates and its records contain a lot of confidential and or sensitive information. Today, Martin and Gordon will generously share 
their experience and expertise with us. But there might be some points there where they have to say, well, I can't tell you that. If that happens, I hope this wouldn't happen. But if that happens, we will all respect their judgment because we all know that it is not a matter of withholding this or that information, but it is the matter of the professional ethics. So I hope you will understand that. Okay, then let's start with Kolya's presentation. So are you ready, Kolya? Yeah, thanks. Let me just share the screen. Um, okay. And thank, thank you, Izumi, for inviting me onto this presentation and to organizing it. Uh, thank um, you to you. <laughs> is, is my screen being shared now? Not yet. Yeah, now it's shared. Okay. So I'd like to just introduce by um, saying this is a presentation about the general context of archives and records in the worldwide energy sector. It's more of a conceptual approach than looking at concrete details in any individual country. So according to a slogan, energy makes the world go round. But what is much often less often said is that records prove that it happens and archivists and record managers make sure that we never forget this. So this presentation will explore the concepts for thinking about why energy records are produced, maintained, and by whom, where, and for what purposes. It's structured as follows. First of all, I'll do a bit of an introduction of records and their importance, and the question of processes, branches, actors, and countries within the world division of labor in the energy sector. Then I'll do a more general introduction to archives and records in the energy sector, and look at more specifically how we think about those energy archives and records based on where they come from. I will then discuss some of the conflicts around in information records and archives in the energy sector and briefly touch on the question of climate change, energy transition and archives and records. And then a few words about AOGAN before passing it on to um, Martin and Gordon from the NDA. So just very briefly, according to the International Standard on Records Management, ISO 15489, records are defined as information created, received, and maintained as evidence and as an asset by a person or an organization in pursuit of legal obligations or in the transaction of business. Records may be intentionally preserved for their internal institutional use, such as operational value, for institutional continuity, institutional memory, or training of new staff, they may be retained also for evidential value, for reconstructing the past, for demonstrating compliance and non-compliance, determination of responsibilities, culpabilities, and redress, so very much of legal importance. They also contain important information necessary for sharing and generating knowledge, and more generally for cultural and historical value. So they may be either of use for an individual institution or for a society as a whole. The question of law is a very important issue when thinking about records and archives. It's, it's never an absolute question what is preserved and accessed in terms of records and information, but this is often extremely legally regulated. Most countries have laws governing records and archives, and additionally, Access to records is further constrained by many different legislations, such as freedom of information or right to information, data protection and privacy, environmental laws, corporate and financial regulation, limitation acts, official secrecy act, commercial secrecy act, uh, laws, and national security laws. These laws will have different names in different countries, but most countries have some kind of framework about this. The individual's rights to access to information is enshrined in the United Nations in international law, stemming from Article 19 of the 1946 Universal Declaration of Rights of Human Rights and subsequent law that's modified this. More recently, since 2011, we have seen the Universal Declaration on Archives issued jointly by the UNESCO and the International Council on Archives. This is not as strong as international law, but is nonetheless a significant document for securing the importance of archives. Archives and records need to be thought of within the context of power. Within individual institutions, 
the specified period for retaining records known as a retention schedule is highly political. Retention periods are the outcome of different and sometimes conflicting interests. It is important to think that some countries are more committed to open access than others. Equally, some countries oblige private sector companies to deposit their archive and records in national archival repositories and make them publicly accessible. Other countries do not. And relating back to the standard I mentioned earlier, despite the fact that this definition only refers to legal activities, many illegal activities may also produce records. Conversely, many activities may occur, but because they are illegal, do not produce records, do not have records produced about them. Or where records are produced from such activities, they may be quickly destroyed or kept closed to the public. So now going to the energy sector and to look at the different processes, branches, actors and countries within the world's energy sector, the vision of labour. Energy is a vital commodity in the world economy with global relations for energy fuel, extraction, processing, production of energy, distribution of energy, consumption and the waste and pollution from energy. This is supported by global markets, global financial flows, a global workforce, global transportation infrastructure, insurance, global monitoring processes, research, security, national, regional and international policy interventions. The energy sector consists of many branches, nuclear, coal, oil, gas, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, biogas. There are certain key industries where energy is consumed, the energy intensive industries with their, their own branches, manufacturing, mining, petrochemicals, industrial agriculture, transport, communication, construction, building and heating and cooling especially. And within this, there are many different actors. There are energy companies, which may be state, private, municipal or cooperative. There are banks, there are international agencies, national governments, industrial associations and lobby groups, research and training centers, national militaries, workers and their trade unions in the energy sector, peasant and indigenous communities whose territories include energy resources or transit routes, leading individuals. These are just some of the many, many actors. And there are also different countries within the world division of labor. They're energy producing countries, energy consuming, energy importing, energy exporting countries. Many of these may be organized into um, regional or sector specific blocks, such as the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries or the Alliance of Small Island States. So these different processes, branches, actors and countries occur within a world division of labor, assuming different roles within the overall sector, uh, sorry, the overall division of labor. This is a conflictive world division of labor, and these conflicts are important in order to understand the situation. They're conflicts between states, questions of territories rich in energy resources or transit routes. They're conflicts between firms for market share and control of energy resources. There are conflicts between capital and labor, workers and employers in a given company. There are conflicts over ownership, private and public ownership, and between energy importing and energy exporting countries. There are commercial conflicts around which currency to trade energy resources in, in the world market. And there are technological choice conflicts over which um, energy source and which energy technologies to use. Their land use conflicts, especially in relation to extraction of energy resources or transportation of energy resources through pipelines. Um, they're questions of the price with different sectors of society struggling over price. So there's conflicts around that. There's conflicts around how waste is managed, how pollution is managed and how the decommissioning processes take place and who bears the cost of those. And there's conflicts over the question of the purpose of energy production, whether it's for industrial or domestic consumption, whether it's for rural or urban consumption. And these conflicts are not just intellectual debates, but have both historically and now assumed very highly physical and often life and death implications. Questions of territorial conquest, occupation and colonialism, wars, coups, um, revolutions, sanctions, nationalizations, privatizations mergers and acquisitions, strikes, protests, land occupations, police, military and paramilitary repression and court cases. 
So this is the context in which we have to think about archives and records in the energy sector. The energy sector and energy intensive sectors are key commodities in the world economy, key infrastructures and key raw materials. So it follows that archives and records in these sectors are also key categories of archives and records in the world economy. Purpose of records management is for understanding the sectoral history, the industrial and economic history, compliance in the sector, transparency and internal operations. And to think about the records, it's necessary to have a long-term historical perspective on the energy and energy sectors and the processes of change within these sectors. This will help us think about production, maintenance and preservation and the use of archives and records. And it's particularly important when thinking about possible future trajectories of the sector. So within individual energy institutions and actors, it's important for questions of inst institutional memory within an organization, training, long-term strategy monitoring, evaluation of the sector's development. And the question of transparency and accountability is extremely important when you consider the powerful nature of energy sector institutions. But it's also vitally important for the question of planning the future of the sector, such as decommissioning plants or building new sectors up, um, new branches of the energy sector. So as with most questions of archives and records, it's important to think of the provenance. And energy archiving requires a provenance-based approach based on um, records, producers and energy intensive sectors specific actors, the processes, relationships, and division of labor outlined in the first bit of the presentation. There are multiple different actors in the energy and energy intensive sectors. So this means there are also multiple different producers and users of archives. And the records will be as unified or as fragmented as the sector is. A monopoly controlled branch of the sector will produce different archives and records to one that has multiple different players. Over time, important changes in ownership have occurred in the sector posing challenges around archives and records. This is exacerbated by the fact that changes in ownership have often been accompanied by political conflict and changes of government. Similarly, recent restructuring of industries at the local level has meant that many installations, plants, or even companies that did exist no longer exist. This raises questions of whether the archives were protected adequately or not. Consequently, a key part of energy archiving and records management is the need to identify and map the key actors, geographical locations, processes, and interrelationships that the sector is based on. And there are also conflicts. The conflicts in the world's energy and energy and sec intensive sectors is both reflected in and often played out in the archives and records of these sectors. Different actors have different material interests in producing, keeping, and using records. Similarly, different actors have different interests in ensuring transparency or secrecy, whether or not to leave a paper trail, and whether or not to make access to records open. Similarly, different actors have different abilities to produce, retain and preserve and make accessible uh, or access the records and interpret archives, records and information in the sector. And there may well be some fundamental conflicts of interest such as um, and different capacities between rich and poor countries and institutions, powerful and powerless, victims and perpetrators of violations, as well as between commercial and non-commercial actors. These conflicts of interest and differences in capacity are not just um, about intellectual differences or ideologies, but are structural in nature. They're defined by worldwide hierarchical and unequal relationships between different actors in the world economy. Some examples of conflicts over information and archives that are important at the moment. The question of international monitoring and sanctioning processes around nuclear energy and nuclear weapons proliferation, especially in relation to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the USA, Iran and North Korea. The question of international monitoring and sanctions around international um, oil trade, especially related to USA, Venezuela and Iran. Or efforts from civil society, for instance, major efforts to hold oil multinationals to account and ensure transparency via use of the freedom of information laws, such as the global initiative around the shell papers. Similar things around other sectors of the um, industry. An important contemporary con question concerns the oil and gas archives in oil producing countries where there's war. 
what has happened to Libya and, oil, and Iraq's oil records, and now what is happening to vital oil records in Armenia. Are they safe or have they um, been destroyed? So this I just want to show you is a very brief picture that I took in 2009, before I was an archivist. Um, it's in a very small village in Colombia, in the Choco region of Colombia. It's called the Casa de la Memoria, the House of Memory. And it's a very small wooden shed. It's a tiny, tiny uh, building. It's about five meters by five meters. It's got handwritten and hand painted um, messaging on the walls and records. And it's basically a list of 120 victims between 1996 and 1997 of um, victims of paramilitary violence in order to displace communities from their land to plant um, palm oil for the agrofuel um, sector. And this is effectively an archive. It's, it's been preserved, it's been documented, and it's protected by the community because they consider it vital evidence. But it's obviously very different from how most archives work. It has very little resources. It's very fragile. You see the pictures at the bottom of the screen. That's the, um, the location. You have to trek through a jungle for 10 hours to get to this village. And it's got like a handwritten sign at the edge saying it's a humanitarian zone where armed actors are forbidden entry. So this is, you know, at the extreme end of an archive compared to an archive that is extremely well-resourced and is um, operating on a much more established basis. So this is the range we need to be looking at. I'll very briefly say a few words before ending about climate change. Um, archives and records management are essential around climate change for understanding its impact, for understanding its causes and its evolution. The question of the long-term long -term approach to climate change means it's very important to evaluate past interventions to chart their course to see where they're going but also to ensure accountability and transparency and the question of assigning responsibility compensation claims and redress becomes extremely important under climate change discussions planning and monitoring and sharing of best practices is also vital another area related to both energy and climate change is the renewable energy sector this is still a relatively new sector and a period that has been influenced by many individual pioneers, many of who were, at least in their early stages, unaffiliated to institutions. Many of this pioneer generation have died or are now very elderly. So a very important question of archives is about protecting their personal archives and making sure that they are preserved. Another question is the very concrete threats that climate change poses to physical archives and libraries, especially from flooding and from fire, which are anyway some of the major physical threats to archives. So in order to protect these, it's very important to identify archives and archival collections that will be at risk from climate change. This will be essential in order to ensure their long-term preservation. So some reflections on the AOGAN network. AOGAN is a network that started in about 11 years ago, and it consists of concrete institutional actors within the energy sector. And these are records producers, records managers, users in the energy sector. So both holders of records and researchers, historians who use the records. It predominantly consists of archives, libraries, and museums. But most of the AIRGAN institutional members are archives associated with either private, state or municipal energy companies, as well as universities and museums. There's currently little involvement in the, in the network from other areas of the energy archiving spectrum, for instance, worker or community or civil society organizations that are active in or impacted by the energy sector. I think it's important that AIRGAN um, gradually brings in such actors, as this will make it more representative of the different actors and the different interests at play within the energy intensive sectors, and importantly, the different records and different categories of record users in the sector. So I'll now pass on to Martin and Gordon, who will talk about the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. This is one particular branch of the energy sector and one particular in one particular geographical part of the world. It's also one particular set of records in the energy sector. 
over to you. Okay, Zimi, can you pull up my slides, please? I think you're muted, Zimi. Um, Martin, I made you presenter, so you should be oh. now. I be can't. Able to... Zimi was going to show my slides for me. I, oh, yeah. Okay. Then... Okay. You're already presenter. And can you already see? Can you see the Martin slide, everybody? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay. 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 I'll hand over to Martin. Okay. I'll I'll uh, tell you when to move the slides on. Is you me? So okay. good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Martin Rob. I'm the uh, national program manager for what's called the Information Governance Program within the NDA, which is the UK Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Could you move on to the next slide, please? Slide two. So uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, and then I will move into the uh, issue of nuclear records and the archive. Uh, I don't intend to read all the words on the slides. I'll talk around the slides. And uh, I have a lot of photographs, which uh, hopefully will uh, generate some interest. So the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority is a non-departmental government body. Effectively, we're part of government. Uh, and we own and are accountable for all the state-owned civil nuclear facilities within the UK. And they currently cover uh, research facilities, fuel production facilities, power stations, and nuclear fuel reprocessing. And Interestingly, the nuclear fuel reprocessing covers all of our international contracts. So we actually reprocess fuel for Japan, for Italy, uh, Germany, and Spain, and one or two others. So we have a lot of nuclear material here from around the world that we reprocess and we return the various products of that reprocessing to the various uh, countries around the world. Uh, we currently spend around about three billion pounds a year and we will continue to spend three billion pounds a year for at least 100 years to decommission our facilities. Uh, the NDA is a small body, uh, we have around about 300 staff and within the uh, group, the organisations around the country have around about 10,000 employees, direct employees and around a further 15,000 uh, contractors supporting us in the decommissioning. Uh, move on to the next slide, please, Izumi. So every five years under uh, legislation, the NDA has to publish a strategy for how we are addressing the uh, decommissioning mission. Uh, the next strategy is currently being uh, draft finalized now and will be issued in 2021. Uh, within that strategy, there is a program uh, sorry, there is a strategy called the Information Governance Strategy, and from that strategy, there is a program which I manage, which is the delivery of that strategy. So I'll just read this particular mission statement because uh, this is important. So the purpose of the uh, strategy is to optimize the business value from our knowledge and information assets in a compliant, secure, and sustainable manner and only investing those things that need to be retained to deliver the NDA mission. It's quite a grand statement, and it, the devil is in the detail. It's very difficult to uh, scope what is included. Uh, the important point is, why are we doing it? And we have a number of benefits that when we actually wrote the business case to develop this program in 2015, these were the benefits that we are going to deliver. So this program's only been going five years and I've got to say I'm very proud of the team and Gordon and Jenny are part of that team to have got where we are within five years. Uh, bearing in mind, we are addressing records from the 1940s through to the present day in the paper, picture, moving film, 
and digital formats and we have to maintain those records and make them accessible for at least 300 years and longer that's the challenge that we've got and the benefits from that is if we don't have records relating to our nuclear waste we cannot manage it and dispose of it if we do not have records associated with land quality contamination in the land we cannot clean our sites and return them to a different use we also have to capture heritage records the impact of our industry and operations on local communities and other industries uh, we also need to ensure collaboration between our different sites around the uk and with our colleagues abroad in other uh, decommissioning uh, facilities around the world there's a small area where we could potentially generate an income for the uk government from some of the information and finally we have to comply with a whole range of regulations regulatory requirements legal requirements and security requirements so we have a conflict as a government body our starting point is all of our records are available to the public however if we did that we will be in breach of our security obligations because as you could imagine there are a number of uh, records due to nuclear materials and uh, physical security areas that we do not make public so there's a fine line and it, it's a bit difficult to define that line and that's what we're trying to do uh, could you move on to the next slide four please so what's in the program uh, there are five areas information management that's what is written down on paper or in digital format there is knowledge management and that's what's in people's heads and then we have what's called here information communication and technology that is it technology we also have a work stream about risk management what is our risk appetite and that is where we decide how much we uh, can release to the public while still maintaining uh, the appropriate security regimes that's an example or are we prepared how, how how many of these records are we prepared to lose over time depending on the overall mission so you could imagine we have a very low risk appetite around waste records we do not want to lose any waste records because that will impact on our ability to manage waste and then the final area is around intellectual property and that's around copyright and protecting not only our intellectual property copyright but that of our suppliers and partners as well so the rest of the talk i'm going to focus on information management and what's important here and gordon will touch on this we manage the information that is given to us so we're about how we manage that information not what is in that information that is the responsibility of others uh, could you move on to the next slide please so under information management so five years ago we created an archive business called nda archives limited it's a subsidiary of our parent company and part of government unusually we operate that with a private company called restore digital and they are our commercial partner and you can see there from the beginning of 2015 by february 2017 we built the facility and it was open we have a major issue as i've mentioned around security and it applies to the physical security of the facility how people access the information digitally and the classifications that were that are applied to the various records uh, the records as i've just mentioned previously cover all media formats and to give you a size of the problem we have if the paper records that we have were stacked up end to end it would make a column 120 kilometers high 
that's just the paper. The digital records are at least as big as that, if not greater, on very old obsolete systems. And that's where Jenny will focus later. Uh, you can see that as a, pub as a public body, we have an obligation to make all of our records available to the public with the caveat that we need to maintain the appropriate security levels, which is obvious in the, the, the area of terrorism at the moment. So the structure, as you can see, we have a building, the archive, which I've called the library. We have a partner, which I've called the librarian, Restore, who provide the people to manage the facility for us. And Gordon is part of that team. We have a record retention schedule and processes and rules about how we manage that information. And then finally, we have all of the sites in the UK that will provide that information into the archive. I've got it separately there. We do have physical records as well. I'll show you one or two examples in the pictures. So it's not just paper, film, it's actually uh, a physical object. Um, and from a heritage point of view, that can cover works of art right the way through to radioactive materials that support the work of the organization. Can you please move on, Izumi? So that's a picture of the facility up in uh, Wick, which is in the north of Scotland. And you can see that's taken in winter. Uh, and uh, it, the building's won a, a number of architectural awards for the facility. Uh, could you move on to the next slide, please? See inside the facility, we've got around, it depends how you measure it, between 25 and 30 kilometers worth of uh, storage for paper. Uh, we also have a digital storage uh, facility for storing the digital records. And we also have a, uh, a separate facility for storing uh, film. Uh, these facilities are humidity and temperature controlled and have the appropriate security arrangements wrapped around them as well. Uh, next slide, please, Azumi. Uh, that's the entrance into the facility. Uh, next slide, please, Azumi. And there's reception before we opened. Uh, you, if you went in there now, you'd, you'd see a lot more. We have displays in the reception area and uh, where because we are open to the public and that gives us some security issues in that the public, there are certain areas the public can go to and there are areas where the public are unable to uh, visit and we have the appropriate security arrangements in place. So next slide, please, Azumi. So I'll just go through quickly the what the NDA encompasses, the sites around the UK. I've picked a few of them. This is the Sellafield site in Cumbria and this is a large reprocessing facility. And you can see on the left of the slide, cooling towers. That was the first commercial operating nuclear power station in the world, Calder Hall. On the right, where you've got the dome, is the next generation of uh, nuclear reactors, uh, the advanced gas cool reactors. And in between are all the reprocessing sites. One of the tall towers, uh, is called, well, they're both called the wind scale piles, and one of those caught fire in around the early 1950s. And we are still dealing with the uh, de decommissioning of that tower 50 years on. Next slide, please, Azumi. Uh, this is inside a cooling pond. This is a new cooling pond, and inside the water, you can see a number of canisters. And inside those canisters are uh, nuclear fuel that has uh, been removed from the current operating nuclear power stations and sent to Sellafield for reprocessing. And they're in the pond there to A, cool the fuel, keep it cool, and also to prevent the radiation uh, leaving the area. That's the shielding. Next slide, please. This is an old cooling pond. So you can see the difference between the new and the old. And this one was built in the 1950s. And you can see the scaffolding, et cetera, there that we're actually decommissioning this nuclear pond. Next slide, please. 
I've put up some pictures here. This is the waste that we return to Japan. Oh, no. and, and on this slide, you can see in the top left is the, ca the, the, uh, the can, the canister that holds the nuclear waste. And you can see we've cut into it so you can see what's inside there. And vitrified waste means it's been heated and turned into glass. So it's, it's a solid lump of glass. Next to that, you can see the handling remote. Ha Sorry, Izumi, can you go back? Yes. Sorry, the next picture in there, you can see the canister being moved around remotely. Then the third picture is where the can canister is remotely through the object on the left of that picture, dropped into the floor uh, under three foot of concrete, and that's where it's stored. Uh, when we have uh, an appropriate uh, collection and system agreed with Japan, we load it into a canister, which is in the picture below. So there's a number of those drums inside that canister, and they are loaded onto one of a number of ships on the left, specialist ships that return the material to Japan. And in, able to, in order to be able to do all of that, we have to have the appropriate records, both in paper and digital format. So if we don't have the appropriate records, as you'd expect, we cannot send this material back to Japan. So there's an example of why these are absolutely vital to the UK. Next slide, please, Izumi. As part of that uh, reprocessing, as well as sending that material back to Japan, these drums contain uranium oxide from the reprocessing as a powder. There is around about 25,000 tonnes of powder in these drums. And this building was one of the largest buildings in Europe. Well, it was the largest building in Europe when it was built. Uh, and we have thousands of drums of powder. And each one of those drums has a set of records that tell you what's in it and where it came from. Without that record, we will not be able to store, uh, move or reuse some of this material. Next slide, please. And again, at the same facility, we have 25,000 tonnes of gas stored in these containers. And this goes back to the 1960s. And you can imagine that's only a small part of it. And again, we have a record for every single one of those drums, which allows us to uh, handle, store, and reprocess the gas that is in one of those drums. Next slide, please. So uh, I'll show you this is a nice picture of one of the decommissioned nuclear power stations. It's in a place called Trisvinith in North Wales, and it's a Magnox power station, very similar to the stations at Fukushima in, in Japan, mm. uh, and the stations in Italy uh, and Spain, uh, because I think the original designs were sold by the UK to those countries. And you can see to the front of one of those buildings is a low building, which is a brand new facility, which is storing some of the nuclear waste that has come from this site. Next slide, please, Mizumi. And inside that building, there are these drums. And these drums take nuclear waste of a particular level called intermediate level waste. And they're on a steel frame and there are eight drums on each frame. To go to the next slide, please, Azumi. And each one of those frames is put inside a concrete box so that the, the radiation is retained within that box to a particular level, but there is still radioactive within that building. So you can see the crane, everything is moved around in that building remotely. Those drums will remain in that building for about 100 years until we have built a facility below ground when we built the facility below ground, those drums will be moved into that facility. So straight away, you can see that we need to retain the records associated with those drums for at least 100 years to allow that to be moved over the public highway and into uh, an underground facility. And then once in that facility, we need to keep them for a few hundred years beyond that as they manage and operate that facility. Of those drums, Today, we have over 75,000 of those drums. 
and we'll probably end up with around about difficult to estimate but between 100 and 150 thousand in total and each one of those drums has around about 800 individual paper records associated with it so you can see it's a massive task to be able to link all those records together next slide please Azumi okay. so uh, to be able to manage all of that we've provided some rules and tools all of these are available on the uh, UK government website we have our own record retention schedule and we have a specification which uh, allows our organisations around the estate to manage the records. Uh, as I mentioned in there, security classification makes this mammoth task even more difficult because we're looking at records going back over 50, 60 years and bringing them up to current standards and as you can imagine over 50 60 years the processes have changed significantly uh, we've put a concept in place in uh, 2015 which was fixed backwards and then fixed forwards so fixed backwards was put some rules in place and address this legacy 120 kilometers of paper thousands of databases and electro electronic platforms and once we put those rules in place we expect the operators in our organization to apply those rules to the records that are about to be created so that we don't create the same problem that we've got that, in other words trying to resolve this legacy of records that have got poor metadata and uh, we're not meeting our obligations to make these available uh, we've started transferring the, the records into the facility it's going to take at least another five years uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made things even more difficult for us and has slowed a lot of uh, the processes down uh, so when we'll be finished uh, I would not want anybody to hold me to account we have a five-year look but it could take longer so the important message is it's not complete yet so where do we go from here well we're putting in place operational metrics so we can measure what we're doing because if you don't measure it you can't control it and when it comes to digital platforms it's a very new evolving area uh, and we have some of the very earliest plat digital platforms right the way through to the most modern can we store these and access these into the future that is a question how do we do that we know what to do with paper and we built the archive for that so that is now the big question is how do we do this digitally going forward so i think that's my last slide is you me and uh, that tees up gordon and jenny to follow on does anybody have any immediate questions i think some people are putting comments and questions in chat and there's uh, already a lot of them all right okay <laughs> but one ah. thing i noticed is about uh the retention period saying natasha and andrew are saying that characteristic time scale is ten thousand years yes what do you think okay. <laughs> okay so uh, where we starting today is paper has a history of about four or five hundred years so we know we can store it in paper format today and for the next four or five hundred years provided it's in the right format uh, sorry the storage conditions and uh, that you actually physically look after it digitally we've only had digital records for about 30 years how are we going to do that moving forward and we don't know yet is the simple answer for 10,000 years how do you do that behind that there are other international working groups which we're part of so an example is can you create a societal memory and can you create that memory through songs through folklore through stories that are passed down verbally 
that's one work stream that's being explored internationally. So we're covering the full range but to address 10,000 years where we are now. We can't do that. An interesting aspect of that is we commissioned a study uh, which is looking at uh, uh, academics who look at Egyptian records and older records. And the simple question we've actually saying to those academics is, what do you wish people had done 3,000 years ago in Egypt to make your life easier to either read the hieroglyphics or to understand why is the pyramid there? We don't know. The pyramid might actually be a warning saying, do not come here. But we don't understand that. So what kind of language do we use? Uh, they're the kind of questions we're asking. Currently, all of our records are in English. But the current form of English has only been in force for around about 200 years. So is English the right language? The jury's out. And I think what will happen is this requires active management over the coming decades and millennia because things will change over time. And you cannot do jump to an answer today for 10,000 years. All you can do is look for the foreseeable future and make some forecasts. So it's not a, uh, a precise answer, because there isn't one. OK, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Then uh, we will have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers after all the presentation is over. So let's move on to Gordon Reed. And we'll all thank Martin for his presentation. Thank you, Martin. So Gordon, are you ready? I don't hear you, Gordon. Can you hear me now? Oh yes, I can hear you. Then okay. I will I will okay. make your slides available. Thank you. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, I can see that. Can you can everyone? Okay. Very good. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, well. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this event. My name is Gordon Reed, so I am the archivist here at Nucleus, which is the, the UK's nuclear archive, the archive for the Civil Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. So what I just want to do is go through some of the procedures that we're adopting to manage the records for the nuclear industry and make them available. So can I have the next slide, please? So these processes will be familiar to any archivist. But what I'm going to talk about applies to both paper and digital records. So the first thing that we have to do is to identify what records exist and capture metadata. So in other words, these are records which go back a long way. And I'll talk about more of these in a bit more detail in a moment. But these are records that in some cases go back 70 years. Uh, we have a, a current metadata standard, as Martin has mentioned, but that has to be applied retrospectively. Not all of these records have been managed in a, in a proper system. So first of all, we have to simply find out what exists. We have to catalogue them. We have to describe them. The next stage, we have to appraise them in order to determine their value. And this is two kinds. First of all, in the industry, and I've put for the short term, but I, I say that with a smile on my face because we know that the short term could be many hundreds, if not thousands of years. And then secondly, we have to decide which of these records will be worth preserving for the future in the archive at Nucleus for future researchers. And these two points are not necessarily the same. And again, we'll touch more on this. But the needs of the industry may not be the needs of researchers. The records that the industry need to keep may not be the records that the researchers of the future need to have. So that's a discussion that we're, we're embarking on at the moment. We have to preserve them. In some cases, that means transferring them to nucleus where they can be stored in uh, current archival standard conditions. 
So in air conditioned repositories that are environmentally monitored to make sure that they are secure. It means repackaging them. It means uh, many, many thousands of records having rusty paper clips taken out of them, having stuck rubber bands peeled off the covers. Uh, it means mold in some cases being cleaned where they've been kept in damp conditions. So we have to do a conservation and preservation exercise and a storage exercise. We have to make them available so to the industry and researchers on request. And again, we'll talk more about this in a moment. But then also, where appropriate, we want to look at how we can supplement the existing record. And anyone who's familiar with working with archives will understand the official record only tells you so much, but it doesn't tell you what really happened. And in many cases, it's the what really happened that's of most interest to the future. So we're at a point where the nuclear industry is 70 plus years old. We're at a point where many of the people who worked in that industry, if they are still with us, they are retired. They're an asset that we don't have access to for very long. So how can we capture their thoughts, their memories, their stories in a way that will enrich the record going forward? And that's a major challenge and again, something we're looking at. Can I have the next slide, please? So out of that, there are three particular, three pressing challenges that, that we face here at Nucleus. So first of all, processing the existing backlog of paper and digital records. And of course, the nuclear industry isn't static. It still exists. It's still generating records in the same way that it's generating electricity. So that's a backlog that is growing. At the moment, we're looking at the historical record, but there is a contemporary record that will need to be managed going forward. Secondly, we need to ensure that the operational business needs of the industry are met, and Martin has touched on this, waste package records, land quality records, decommissioning records. And one of the things I've learned from my time working as an archivist, generally speaking, there are two kinds of inquiries. There's routine inquiries, which you deal with in the normal course of events. And then there's the other kind of inquiry when something has happened, when something has gone wrong, where you need access to the information instantly. So uh, generally speaking, in my experience, um, we need to be prepared for both kinds. If there is ever an emergency, we need to be able to deal with that. So we need to make sure that the information we're gathering about these records uh, is the right information and that it's available. And as many disasters down the years have shown in many countries, there are a limited point in having all of your systems on a computer if the electricity goes, if your backup generator goes. So how do we ensure that these records can be preserved and made accessible? And then the third challenge, how do we create an archive for posterity? So out of all of these many, many millions of records and documents that exist across the NDA estate, how do we ensure that we can create an archive that will be of genuine value to researchers in the future? And it's an impossible question to answer, but how can we address that to the best of our ability? Next slide, please. This isn't absolutely up to date, but it's a, it's a nice picture and it gives you a good overview of the range of sites across the United Kingdom, but also the physical geographical challenge that we face. Because if you see right at the very top of the map, there's an arrow pointing to Doonray, right up at the far north. Nucleus, the archive, is about 30, 35 miles uh, east of Doonray. So as you'll see, most of the, the sites around the UK were in England and around the coast. So there are hundreds and hundreds of miles separating us. So there are 17 or so sites of records all of these sites kept records. They all have to be managed. They all have to be processed. And the ones that are important will have to be transferred up to Nucleus. So there's a logistical challenge as well as an information management challenge that we're facing. Next slide, please. So let's just take the backlog for starters. It's huge. There's a vast number of records here from all over the United Kingdom, and they go back 70 plus years. 
A further challenge is that, of course, different sites were doing different things. They used different processes. Um, some of them were research sites. Some of them were electricity generating sites. Uh, this gives us a challenge for standardization. In other words, we do not have a uniform retention schedule that we can apply across the board because different sites have different records that meet different criteria. So one of the things we're looking to do is to integrate and try and come up with an overarching retention schedule. But at the bottom line is that we're still going to have to be, there's going to be variance, there's going to be variety, there's going to be an element of difference. And of course, in terms of devising a system that will manage these records, a database, it'll have to take into account many different kinds of criteria for retention. Many records are unlisted or not listed to the current standard. And you can look at the standard online. Uh, the NDA has published its, its metadata, uh, its cataloging requirements. It's called, the document is called IMP06, and there's a link on the slide. But it identifies all the metadata fields uh, in accordance with Dublin Core that we're looking to capture uh, and how we are applying the, the system across those various fields. And finally, again, as Martin touched on, there's a variety of legacy data sets on a variety of often outdated systems and software. So not only do we have a huge backlog of paper records, there is a backlog of digital records, and there is a huge number of databases across the NDA estate and across the other sites still generating electricity, which at some point will have to become part of an archive and records management system. Next slide, please. We've touched on retention. Uh, this is in many ways the biggest, the hardest thing for me to understand when I came into this job, because I'm used to thinking that archives are kept forever. And as an archivist, you know, we use this phrase a lot, permanent preservation. But of course, the records of the nuclear industry, some of those records, particularly the records relating to nuclear waste, are going to have to be kept for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. In other words, these are records that will have to be kept for longer than most archives have been in existence. And we report to the National Archives, the British National Archives in London, and they laughed. They said, well, these are records that you're going to keep but you may not archive. They said these are records that need to be kept for a certain period of time, and then when they're no longer needed, they can be destroyed. So he said, these are what we would class as temporary records, but we're gonna to have to redefine the meaning of the word temporary if you're talking about 300 to 1,000 to 10,000 years. And of course, that is the challenge. Um, not only is it a question of preserving the records for that length of time, but again, as Martin said, it's making sure that they can be understood you know, what is the point of keeping a record for 500 years if in 500 years the person who looks at it needs particular knowledge in order to understand it that is no longer generally available? So there's quite a wide question around not just preserving the records, but preserving background secondary information that tells you what those records mean. And of course, the potential for doing that is enormous. Um, you know, nucleus could end up becoming uh, a library bigger than the British Library if it needs to retain all of this kind of information. But it's one of the challenges that we face. So we need to keep these records because they will be required. Somebody needs to check on them. Somebody needs them for a specific purpose. So we're not talking about archives. We're not talking about research. We're only talking about the industry. So. The records of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority are public records, they're government records, so they're covered by the Public Records Act. And that means that you have to make a decision about all of your records after 20 years. So you have to decide, are we going to keep it? Are we going to destroy it? Is it going to become an archive? If you say we want to keep it because we need it, again, under the Public Records Act, you have to ask permission. You have to go to uh, ultimately the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. So we have to go to the government and say, we would like to keep these records. 
And if you want to keep the records closed, because you say these records are secret, again, you have to ask permission. It is no longer possible in the United Kingdom to say, we want these records to be closed because we say so. You have to say, we would like to keep these records closed for this reason, please will you approve it? So uh, there's a whole mechanism in place to ensure that records are only kept secret where they have to be. And the, the onus, the emphasis, the drive is to make records publicly available where possible. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes, that's the one, thank you very much. So um, archiving is our next challenge, as I touched on before. So how do we create an archive for all of these out of all these many millions of documents, these many millions of papers? We know that the operational needs of the industry will not be the same as the research needs of academics. Anyone who's worked in a public archive will know this. But you can't keep everything. There, there's just too much. Also, nor would you want to, because of course, an awful lot of the records are ephemeral, travel claims, invoices, stationary orders. So how do you actually decide what gets kept? And of course, there is an element of subjectivity in archiving. It's somebody's opinion that this is of value. So. The Public Records Act sets out a methodology and at 20 years, you have to make that decision. Do you archive it? Do you keep it forever or do you destroy it? Those decisions are made in the first instance by what they call consultant reviewers. So these are normally retired people from the industry. In our case, many of these will be retired nuclear scientists who will understand the records but will also have an understanding of the historical perspective. So what kinds of things might people find interesting? And all of the records which are identified as being potential archives will be reviewed by these experts. And they will advise us on which ones they feel are worth preserving permanently. We're building in some checks and balances. So there are Others of us on the uh, involved in this project who have an archival background, who will be in a position to look down the lists and say, well, are you sure? What about this one? You didn't think this was worth keeping. Can we just check? So we want to make sure that there's a wide range of views. In the same way, we will be consulting with the various uh, sites, the people who produce the record and asking their opinion, which of these do you think are worth keeping? So hopefully we will manage to prevent too many things slipping through the net, that we will actually select a really good representation of the records of the industry for posterity. And there has been published, it's going to be updated, but you can see online the National Archives have what they call an operational selection policy. These are for all government departments and essentially they indicate what records are worth keeping? What are the kinds of things you should be looking out for when you're making those decisions? And you can see the one for the nuclear industry online, uh, well worth checking out and hopefully reassuring if anybody has any concerns because it is very thorough. You know, if we follow that, that policy, um, we should actually end up with a very good archive, I hope, in several hundred years time. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And this is, this is really the end of what I was going to say. I'm, I'm giving you an overview. Um, if anybody would like to contact me offline, I've put my email in the chat. Uh, I would be very happy to talk through in detail how we're going about some of these things. But where are we now? Uh, we're obviously at the very beginning of a journey that will last well into the future. You know, as far as, 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 far as forever as I'm capable of thinking of, it's going to be a very long time that this project has started. That's why it is so important, it is vital that we get things as right as we possibly can now. Will we make mistakes? Of course. But if we try to anticipate the needs of the future now, 
we can start to ensure that the right records are kept for as long as they need to be kept, but then ultimately that the right records are archived or destroyed. Uh, again, as Martin said, the nucleus has been built. You can see some of the shelves of nucleus behind me as I speak in my, in my little office. Uh, it's a wonderful facility. It, it is amazing. Uh, and uh, it's fantastic that it has been built here in Caithness, so close to the uh, uh, experimental facility at Dunray. So simply having a building, having a facility capable of storing so many records is an amazing achievement. Uh, there are currently some 70 people working in this building. And we're only scratching the surface of the issue here. The records of several sites have already been transferred. So Harwell and Dunray, for example, their records are now with us. Work has begun on processing legacy paper collection. So many of the other records from those other sites that I showed you on the map have got to be processed before they are transferred up. So work has begun with Sellafield, going through what we call the sift and lift program. Uh, teams of people literally taking a box off the shelf, checking the records, cleansing it, removing the rusty paper clips, cataloging it, reboxing it, transferring it up to Nucleus. We have recruited a panel of consultant reviewers, and we expect to start the work of uh, reviewing files selecting for permanent preservation next year. Mm. So that part of the process will start to become a regular process. And every year you will hopefully see uh, every January uh, there will be a few more files added into the public domain. And going forward, that will just become that'll become a trickle, will become a river, will become a torrent, will become a flood. Uh, and we're hoping that within within a decade, nucleus can I think become a major centre for research and learning in the nuclear industry. And now that we've got a methodology for paper records slowly starting to coalesce, we're putting the shift towards digital records. How do we address the legacy problems of digital records? How do we ensure that the information, regardless of how it is stored, how can we ensure that that information is made available to people for hundreds of years into the future. So it's a it's a major challenge. So I'm, I'm sorry if that was just a light touch overview. As I say, we'd be very happy to go into more detail uh, offline. Once the world returns to something approaching normality, we would be very happy to welcome you to Nucleus and show you around and let you see for yourselves uh, some of the things we've been talking about. But in the meantime, if, if there's any urgent questions, I'll happily take them. If not, I'm happy to pass on to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any urgent questions like Martin and Gordon said? If not, uh, as Gordon touched about the digital preservation issue, I would like to hand it over to Jenny the Digital Preservation Coalition. I will make you a presenter, Jenny. Great. Thank Thanks. you, Gordon. Okay. Is that working okay? Can you see my slides yet? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Zimi. So, um, my name is Jenny Mitchum. I'm Head of Good Practice and Standards at the Digital Preservation Coalition. So, I think from the um, presentation so far today, it's, it's fairly obvious um, why digital preservation is so important for nuclear records. So I'm going to focus in on this particular topic and in particular talk about a model that we've developed um, for the NDA, um, but that is actually available for all of you to use. And it's called the Rapid Assessment Model or DPC RAM. And I did just um, pop the link in chat there if you want to follow that and see what I'm talking about. So this is what I'm going to cover. Um, I'll briefly go into um, what digital preservation is, though I suspect you probably all know. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Digital Preservation Coalition, um, just to set this work in context. And then I'll move into DPC-RAM, which is our rapid assessment model. 
So this is a definition from di of digital preservation taken from our digital preservation handbook, which is available for all of you to look at. And it says digital preservation refers to the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as appropriate. Um, and then it goes on. Um, I've highlighted in bold there um, the points which I think are most important here. And that is that digital preservation is a series of activities. It's not a one-off activity. It's not an ad hoc activity. It's done in a very controlled way and it has to be revisited periodically. So Gordon talked a bit about access. Um, the, the reason we do digital preservation is, is essentially for access so that people can access the records uh, either now or in the future. There's no point in preserving it if we're not aiming for access in the future. And also it's about preserving things for as long as appropriate. So it's not about keeping everything forever. And I think uh, Gordon's made that point uh, quite clearly again. Um, there's a much simpler or more informal definition here at the bottom um, from one of my colleagues, Paul, who says, digital preservation is about putting common sense strategies in place to save a lot of effort and pain further down the line. I quite like that one as well. Um, it, it's sometimes helpful to talk about what digital preservation isn't as well. So it's not just about backing things up. Um, this is what some people who might be coming at this from an IT background often think is just about backing things up. That's absolutely not the case. It's not the same as digitization. So digitization really just creates a, a additional stream of digital content that you have to preserve. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem. As I mentioned in the previous slide, it's not a one-off activity, it's a series of managed activities. It's certainly, and sadly, not a solved problem. I guess if it was, I probably wouldn't have a job. Um, there's no kind of magic bullet for digital preservation that's going to solve it for us. And also there's no clear finish line. So this graphic at the bottom is a little bit misleading. Um, we're not all running to the finish line, it's more of a relay race and we're trying to hand the baton onto the next generation. So um, it's a quote at the bottom here saying, nothing has been preserved. There are only things that are being preserved. So if someone says, says to you, oh, I've preserved that, um, they're lying. It hasn't been preserved. It's just in the process and it's an ongoing process. So a bit about the, the Digital Preservation Coalition, which is the organisation I work for. So we're a membership organisation and we support our members to do digital preservation. I guess if digital preservation was a solved problem, we wouldn't need to exist. So we're funded by our members, we're also led by our members. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We've got nine members of staff currently, but we're just about to recruit another one. We started off in 2002 and um, are based in the UK. And most of our members came from the UK at that point. But now we are very much international and keen to become more international. So we welcome international members. This year we opened our first international office in Australia. Um, and uh, I know there's a very international audience here today. We'd love to hear from you if you're interested in joining. So we've currently got 111 members. And some of them are uh, showing on this slide here. I would say this isn't complete, so, so our newest members probably aren't on this slide. But this just gives a sense of the range of members we have. So we have a lot from, I guess, the more traditional archives and libraries and memory institutions. We've also got a lot of members working in universities, um, but then also the non-traditional archive and library uh, members would be people like the NDA, people like banks, um, businesses, we've got Unilever and Bacardi, um, European Central Bank. So we're not just an organisation for libraries and archives. So onto the main uh, purpose of this presentation really, which is to talk about DPC RAM. So what is it? Well, it's a maturity model for digital preservation. So RAM stands for Rapid Assessment Model. And I should say, I know for many of you, English isn't your first language. Um, RAM in English is a male sheep, which is why there's lots of cartoons in this presentation involving uh, male sheep, RAMs. 
So RAM is applicable for all organisations who have digital content of long term value. And the idea of it is that it facilitates continuous improvement. So it helps you work out where you are in digital preservation and also where you should be and thus um, working out the gap, working out where you need to improve. Where is it? Well, um, I put the link in chat already, so hopefully you're already there. Um, it's freely available on our web. I just want to highlight um, that we have uh, two translations of RAM currently. So we have uh, the, the English version uh, is the kind of a master, but we have recently released a translation in Japanese and in French. And we were able to release those uh, just last month on World Digital Preservation Day. So it was really yeah, exciting to see those, those become available. So how did it came out, come about? So it came out of our work with the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. So the NDA are one of our members and we're working on a project with them at the moment. And as part of this project, they wanted a way of assessing where they are in digital preservation and also setting goals for the future. So as Martin Rob said, you can't, if you can't measure it, you can't control it. So it's, it's almost like a project management tool to work out where you are, <clears throat> where you need to be, and then put steps in place to move you towards that goal. So as part of this project, we didn't set out to create another maturity model for digital preservation or to reinvent any wheels, but all the models that we looked at, they just didn't seem to quite fit uh, the context of the NDA. So often they were aimed at much more traditional memory institutions like libraries and archives, or also um, universities uh, managing research data. So when we developed this um, last year, just over a year ago. Um, we didn't exactly start from scratch, um, so we based it on a model that had been published by Adrian Brown of the UK Parliamentary Archives. And he had um, developed a digital preservation maturity model that he published in this award-winning book. It's a great book, um, do have a look at it. Uh, and we contacted Adrian and asked if he was happy for us to take the model from his book and develop it further and rename it and rebrand it uh, and make it available to everybody and he was uh, fortunately very happy for us to do that and actually helped us in the process so a big thank you to Adrian for that. So you might all be wondering what RAM looks like. So here it is, it has these 11 sections. Um, these are split into organisational capabilities um, and service capabilities. And the organisational capabilities are the things that your organisation might need to have in place in order to actually start setting up digital preservation um, facilities. So it's to do with staffing, resourcing, it's to do with things like policy and strategy. I think um, Cola mentioned at the start the importance of the, the legal framework that you're working in. It's about whether you've got IT capability to work in this area uh, as well. And then the service capabilities are more about the hands on things that you're actually doing uh, with the digital content that comes to you. So how you're acquiring it, how you're preserving it, how you're managing the metadata. Actually just slipping off the bottom of the screen there um, is discovery and access. So it's how you're providing access to it. And for all of these 11 sections within DPC RAM, you um, give yourself a score from naught to four. So naught being um, you're really not doing anything in this area. <clears throat> you perhaps don't even know it exists or don't know anything about it. And four is the sort of the top level. That's when you're optimised. That's when you're uh, working really efficiently in this area in quite a proactive way. So this is how to use it. So it's a two stage process, really. So firstly, you work out where you sit currently. Of course, it makes sense to be honest and realistic. Um, there's examples in the model that uh, are designed to help you work out where you are, but we do encourage you not to take those too literally because you might be doing quite a similar thing, but in a slightly different way, and that's fine. And once you've given yourself a score as to where you are now, um, then you need to work out where you would like to be in the future. So again, we would encourage you to be realistic here. So not everyone has to aim for the top. Not everyone needs to be optimized across the board. 
the clues in the name really, we call it the rapid assessment model because it is designed to be quick and easy to use. Um, it can take as little as an hour to work through. Uh, if you really know your stuff, you understand digital preservation, you know what your organisation's doing. But I do know of, of many of our members that have taken the opportunity to sit around the table with colleagues and get together and do it as a collaborative exercise uh, and take a little bit longer over it. And that can actually be a really effective way to, to work with the model and get buy-in from colleagues at the same time. Um, to help you along the way, we've provided a couple of templates. One of those is in Microsoft Excel as a spreadsheet. Um, so you just simply enter in your scores, uh, write a few notes. And what that template does for you is it creates some visualizations on the fly. So this is the radar chart that it produces. So in this chart, the, um, the thick blue line is where you are now and the dotted grey line is where you'd like to be and the circles of that chart starting at naught and going out to four are showing an increasing level of maturity so looking at a chart like this it's really easy to um, work out where the biggest gaps are in terms of what you're doing now and where you'd like to be so it's quite a nice thing that you could show to colleagues you could put it on a powerpoint slide um, you could take it to your senior managers you could put it in a business case for digital preservation um, so you can do what you want with it really. So doing your RAM assessment is I guess the quick and easy bit, um, the harder bit is working out what to do next uh, and how to address those gaps that you might have highlighted in your assessment. So a good place to start is to share it with colleagues uh, if you haven't already and start a conversation. You could include it in a business case for digital preservation, We'd encourage you to set priorities and think about which areas you want to move forward first and um, perhaps establish a roadmap or a plan for moving forward. The other thing we really encourage you to do is to not treat this as a one-off exercise. So use it in a more active way. Um, do it as a yearly exercise to keep track of where you are and to, to log improvements and think about what you need to do next. So obviously we'd, we developed this model initially for the NDA, but there are much wider benefits for everybody. So RAM is freely available for anyone to use. Uh, any group of organisations could use RAM as a basis for a conversation or benchmarking or knowledge exchange. But we also have some benefits that are specific to DPC members. So for our members, we'll sit down with them and help them. Uh, complete their RAM assessment if they want us to, offer, offer advice, answer questions. And also we encourage members to submit their results to us. So this uh, helps us understand our members. So it, it's helpful if we're providing advice and support that we kind of get a sense of where they are currently. Um, but it also helps us in terms of our planning of the DPC programme for the year. So we run various bits of training and events and uh, networking and idea exchange type events. Um, so it can help us really target where members are looking for help at, at the, the current time, try and target our programme uh, in line with this assessment. We also provide members with anonymised um, benchmarking data so they can get a sense of where they are in relation to the rest of the membership and I think, think that's quite useful for them as well. So just wanted to end with a big thank you firstly to the, the UK Nuclear Decommissioning Authority um, for supporting the development of this model for the benefit of everybody and also for our volunteer translation team. I've just put the names of the people who helped with the Japanese translation here though of course we also have a French translation and I also thank uh, those uh, the people involved with that. Um, and uh, just to say as well that our, the translation of our resources is totally based on volunteer effort. You know people come to us and say I'd like to translate this and um, so if you would like to translate DPC RAM or any other of our resources do just get in touch with me I'd love to talk to you and that's it from me just a reminder of the URL there for DPC RAM and my contact details thank you for listening 
Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Jenny. I did DPC RAM myself, and it's a maturity model, but I found out that my institution is uh, not mature at all. <laughs> we, are, we are like a newborn baby as to the maturity. But yeah, that that gave us a picture of where we are, and it, it, it's kind of, it gives us hope of growing up. <laughs> thank yeah, you so much for great. developing. Developing great, DTC yeah. RAM with NDA. That's a great job. Okay, thank you for the presenters. I would like all the presenters to open your mic. And I saw a lot of interesting discussion going on on chat, but I I really can't follow everything. So uh, all the speakers, I would like to ask you to condense the interesting conversation on chat. Uh, with regards to your answers. Okay, like, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll go first then on one of the, the comments. Uh, the obvious one is, why is the archive built as far away as it possibly can be from any large centers in the UK? Yeah. And I get asked this all the time, and there are two reasons. The first one is, when the UK shut down lots of its coal mines, the local communities were thrown out of work overnight and that created big problems within the uh, local areas. So when the NDA was set up, we had an obligation to mitigate the impact on the local uh, communities from when we shut down our operations. And we've identified three areas in the UK where that has a big impact. One is in Cumbria next to Sellafield. The other one is in North Wales, near Trusfinneth, where I showed that. And the third one was up in Doon Ray. Well, Sellafield had plenty of investment, so we decided not Sellafield. And based on various criteria, it went to Doon Ray. It could equally have gone to North Wales, but it went to Doon Ray. And the impact of a hum circa 100 people directly in and the supporting industry to that in an area where there's only 15,000 people is a very big impact. So number one, that's why it went up to Doon Ray. To mitigate the risk of it being so far away, the concept is nothing will ever leave the archive in paper format. It will always be digitized and shared. So we will have a digital archive that is accessible to all. So on that basis, it doesn't matter where it is. So that was the reason that one was too weak. Gordon. Can I just add, add to that and say that um, we operate a scan on demand service um, and we have already been told by some of the, uh, the users from people whose records have been sent that uh, they find it's a better service from WIC than it was when it was a few hundred yards in a shed down the road. So um, we're providing, you know, once the records are here, they're instantly available and we can digitize them and send them out. And the other point, of course, is that um, some records will become archives and they will be publicly declared and available. But some records, most of our records, well, all of our records are covered by the Freedom of Information Act. So mm. in theory, everybody has the right to ask to know if we have a record and if possible can they see it and unless there is a concrete reason for it to be closed we can scan that record and send it to a member of the public and the industry itself is taking the approach the nda and all of the sites wherever possible we want the records to be available and they can be instantly made available to people unless there's a particular reason, unless there's a particular, you know, they're secret or there's an, F, there's an exemption or it's personal data, the records should be available. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And there was also a very interesting question uh, about disposing wrong records or uh, things oh. related to appraisal. Did yeah, you so answer? I'll, yeah. I'll pick that one up again. And the, the comment is, I'm certain we will throw away something that we will later regret that we should not have thrown away. Mm. But the starting point is, when we have the volume of material we have with very poor data associated with it, 
you struggle to find anything today anyway. And therefore, if you can't find it, you might as well not have it. That's the concept. I do know from an archivist point of view, we do have archives where we just have boxes stored and people will come and search through them all the time. In fact, my daughter does that. However, when we have 500,000 boxes of paper records and we generate 300 boxes every single month, and that's going to go on for another 100 years, it's physically impossible to keep that volume. So we have to rationalize our record retention schedule and it, it took circa five well maybe nearly 10 years to produce and is based on a review of every single piece of UK legislation that says what you need to keep and it cost a cost lot of money and the oil and gas industry in the UK has just adopted our record retention schedule because if we comply with that retention schedule we comply with all the laws. On top of that, we have another two requirements, and this is the hard bit. One is we need to keep them for business reasons, which is waste records to allow us to deliver for the long term. The second one is for heritage. What would people want to review? And you can't keep everything. And my argument is, well, an accountant wants me to keep the financial records and the invoices. A social uh, uh, researcher wants to look at, I don't know, believe it or not, the menus in the local canteens in the on the operating sites. On that basis, if I ask everybody what they want to keep, the answer is keep everything. Mm. So you've got to be pragmatic and say, we can't keep everything. We will do what we can. And from the heritage point of view, uniquely, we've set up a group within the UK and the UK, and I'm talking of the three separate countries that make up the UK, Scotland, Wales, and England. We don't have records in Northern Ireland. And for those three bodies or countries, we have a working group that includes representatives of the national museums and the uh, national archives, and the national historic bodies those organizations that say we need to keep this building because it is of historic value and all those bodies we brought them all together we said let's review the retention schedule and our approach to the heritage items recognizing we can't keep everything and we've created some guidance that is will be made available to the public it's pretty much out there now it's version one i'm waiting for COVID got in the way and I'm waiting for the feedback from the Scottish and the Welsh contingents that will then be made public say these are the guidelines we are adopting from a heritage perspective to help keep records permanently beyond the retention schedule from a heritage perspective a good example in there is the record retention schedule makes no reference to uh, magazines and newspapers produced by each of the organizations and they are a very rich source of heritage information so from a heritage perspective we're saying we will keep those records we don't have to keep them from a record retention schedule we don't have to keep them from a legal perspective but we will keep them where we can where we can find them and access them for heritage reasons so it's a balance and it's a balancing act that is almost impossible to satisfy everybody. That's the hard bit, but that's what we're trying to do to bring those bodies together. And I'll awesome. give a specific example. The Calder Hall power station, uh, we had feedback from the historic bodies wanted to keep that reactor physically there. Well, oh. we took them around and said it's radioactive. It's gonna cost millions of pounds and nobody can walk around it anyway because it's radioactive. Why would we do it? And we've accepted that we're going to create a paper record of the facility rather than a physical record. Sorry, I was, I was just going to add, add to what Martin was saying. Um, as we know, you know, it's one of the truths of archiving and I, I use it a lot. No record, once it's in an archive, once it's selected for permanent preservation, 
no record is used for the purpose it was created for. You know, we, we create records as byproducts of an industry, but we collect records for research. And it is almost impossible to disentangle the two, but it's also very difficult to predict the research needs of the future. It's a best guess, I think, is the most we can say. Yeah. Um, and um, in terms of the, the makeup of the people who are the consultant reviewers, they are trained to look for historical interest. The operational selection policy I referred you to gives you that indication. You know, these are the records they're looking for. This is the kind of thing we're trying to keep. And um, all we can do ultimately, we will be keeping records of everything that is destroyed. We'll be keeping records of everything that's kept. Um, we will evaluate it as we go. And we will just, you know, we'll do the best we can, but we'll have to just try and see how it's working out. My, my feeling is that actually we will end up keeping too much to begin with because people will be uncertain. They won't want to say, oh, let it go. So we'll probably end up keeping too much. Um, but ultimately, it's just going to be a question of let's just try it and see. Yeah. We genuinely okay. don't know because we haven't done it yet. What, oh, to, to, to build on what Gordon said, when we built this archive uh, five years ago, we had to guess how big it was going to be. And it really was a guess. Uh, and we've got a very big archive. Uh, and we assumed that we would, based on evidence from other industries, that we would end up destroying about 80% of the records. Mm. But we are actually only destroying about 40% of the records. That's fine. What that now gives us is a challenge. In the current environment, can I go and get some more money to save these records? Or do we digitize them and, and then destroy the paper record and I just create a digital archive? But then we have an issue can we be confident that the digital record will not be lost over time? That's where Jenny comes in, because it's cheaper to keep a digital record than it is a paper one. We have a fine balance on this. Uh, and as I said, there is no right or wrong answer. And I suppose, again, sorry, at the risk of this becoming a, a duologue, um, just to add to that, that um, what, you know, for example, um, under the Freedom of Information of Act, you cannot close a record because it will be embarrassing to you. Um, it's one of the things that I take very seriously is being an archivist working here. The fundamental principle of archives is impartiality. It's trust. It's evidential value that a record comes into the archive and it must be trusted. Someone looks at this in 300 years time. They must know that that is the true record. It has not been tampered with. And I am very pleased at the attitude that the NDA has taken because they want it to be a true record of the industry. This is not propaganda. We are not here to weed out embarrassing records or change the record in any way. We are here to create a true record, as true a record as possible, of what happened. And I think that's actually something to be very proud of, warts and all. Because, um, you know, if it's, if it's an archive, it has to be reliable. It has to be trustworthy. And all we can be is as open and transparent as we are. And as Martin says, we'll make mistakes, but we'll do it with the best of intentions and we'll be honest about it. Yeah. I'll just pick yeah. up. Mm. Sorry, there's some comments okay. about that we, we're dodging pointed questions. I uh, feel a bit disappointed about that because I don't feel we are. <laughs> So I don't know who's putting that in. Uh, I think the issue comes around the uh, the secrecy element. And okay. just touching on that, because the environment changes uh, and it changes regularly. I mean, I'll, I'll throw out some facts. From a uh, an IT perspective, the NDA IT network gets uh, 300,000 attacks every month. So we're getting attacked constantly, and it's a real dilemma. It, could you just imagine if, by being completely open, uh, from a digital perspective, what damage could be done? Uh, so it is a fine balance. And 
and I'm sitting here with the people from an information and knowledge background say everybody should have access to everything that's great and I agree with that when you talk to the C the uh, uh, security group perfect security is nobody has access to anything and that gives you perfect security so now you have to balance those two and from a, uh, a security point of view and a, and a terrorist threat the the key elements are that you've got to protect and this is where you get into documentation which is uh, type of material quantity of material and where it is and there is a dilemma of something called uh, aggregation so you might find that uh, releasing 10 documents aggregated gives all that information out whereas each individual document doesn't so that is a real dilemma in all of that uh, i'll give you an example that we're considering and working on we can have you can have a secret file that consists of 100 documents and that's bundled up as a secret file but only one of those documents is secret but because it's bundled with the other 99 that are not secret they get classified as secret so the questions we're asking now can we split that and keep the one document that is secret secret and release the other 99 and we're in the middle of having that dialogue with the appropriate uh, security personnel to say can we do that that's an example of what we're trying to do in terms of being transparent okay is there anything to add gordon or no i think that's it thank you okay thank you so maybe we can open the mic for this the attendees to ask questions that are not covered in chat or if you if you have any questions please feel free to unmute and ask questions or um, oh, I'd, I'd also a, like to address one of the questions in the chat okay. that I think is is a very important question. The the last question about the um, developing and least developing countries I think is a very important question. It has a couple different aspects. One is how will developing countries be able to use these technologies, these institutional approaches, these methodologies to archive their own records in the nuclear energy sector and other energy sectors. And the other is how will they be able to access um, records held in other countries. So for instance, how will the NDA um, archives be accessible? And the a third issue I think particularly important is the question of the international nature of the energy sector and the nuclear industry. I mean, in particular with uranium coming from countries like Namibia, Mali, I think it's very important that that worldwide um, division of labor, that worldwide commodity chain is is considered. And I don't have the answers how, how um, British records will be made accessible in Namibia. I think that's a question that involves more than individual archival institutions it will involve the national archives it will involve the department for international development here it will involve you know addressing some very major inequalities in the world economy which is not necessarily the remit of an individual archival institution in the country to do but i think it's a very important consideration um that just to, to say that yeah uh, i think the uh, and forgive me because those who are more IT literate than me, I believe that the uh, NDA archive uh, website, when we go live, that can be accessed internationally. I don't believe there's any. Uh, that's going to be launched in the middle of next year. So that what we're doing, we will have two digital archives. We will have one for our operational uh, uh, requirements, the day-to-day -day activities, and all the records will sit in there. As the records are identified for being released to the public, they will be digitized and transferred to a publicly accessible website, very similar to the National Archives, where the public will have direct access to search 
and download all those records. Now you can imagine we've got 70 years worth of records to address. Uh, you can see the size of the team we've currently got, which is 70 up in width, 40 people down here in Warrington. Uh, we're going to be taking another 20, 30 people. So we'll have 150 people working for the next 10 years on going through these records and digitizing them where appropriate and a group of uh, reviewers, number one, moving these records into the public domain. And the, and the answer for moving them into the public domain is they go into the public domain unless there is a reason, not the other way around. We're not looking for a reason to release them. We're looking for a reason to retain them. And there is some clear guidance on that. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, there's one question I noticed in chat saying that this, there should be some kind of Japanese perspective because it was hosted by a uh, Japanese uh, repository too. So I did my homework myself, even though I don't know anything about nuclear decommissioning. And I checked some of the documents online on some of the Nandaro it, contractors for decommissioning and also the nuclear white paper of the Japanese government. And they are really doing their job of decommissioning of the technology issues and the community issues, but there's no mention of record keeping. And I, I am sure that the, all the records of decommissioning are closed for research and they are in the hands of private companies or corporations who are doing the job. So there are a lot of talk about secrecy or you know, not enough disclosure in the archives, but uh, from the Japanese perspective, having an archive on nuclear decommissioning is a dream. <laughs> so, um, hmm. so it's, and, and I, I, I guess from the communication on chat, there's always a difficulty in building trust in this kind of situation because and in Japan, especially where the trust for the public records or nuclear industry as a whole is corroding from inside in a way. So how are you dealing with this problem of building a trust within the community or within the industry? Martin and Gordon, maybe. Gordon. Gordon. Hmm. I suppose. The point is, I, I, I was thinking this about my, my sort of life in archives, is that generally speaking, it's it's incredibly rare to have a position where you can choose what records are preserved. Usually you can only preserve what has survived. Mm. So effectively, we're, we're putting our, our thumb on the scale of history right the way down the line. And, and as Martin has said, we are we are here to preserve. We're not here to create. The records are created by the industry. Um, we are to be trusted to, to preserve them, I think. And that would be my feeling about it. Um, I think there is a huge benefit to, um, you know, I'm, I'm not from the nuclear industry. I'm an archivist. I, I think of myself as a gun for hire. So um, I, I think back slight with amusement to my physics teachers from 50 years ago, if they could see me now, um, I think they would be either laughing or in disbelief. Um, so um, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to, to introduce into this is effectively the, the nuclear industry has, has happened and, and it's kind of shot off in lots of different directions over the last 70 years to meet particular needs. It's now at the point where it's taking stock of itself. And I think the really important thing is to make sure, as I say, it's openness and transparency wherever possible. Um, selecting what you can, destroying what you have to, and being upfront and making as much available as you possibly can. Sorry, that's a bit that's a bit bland, but I'll pick up the comment about uh, consultant reviews and names, etc. Uh, we have a uh, an obligation under the GDPR regulations around protecting people's identity, etc. So, for example, at the beginning of this uh, uh, recorded uh, conversation, uh, Marta was very clear to point out that it was all being recorded, and therefore, by your, everybody staying online, 
you've accepted that your personal data is now available to people on here. So it's a real area that we have to uh, comply with uh, in that area about the uh, the names of individuals. But certainly we can actually expose the uh, experience and qualifications of the individuals that we're looking at to, to do the reviews. Uh, that, that's a good point. I can't see anything wrong with that so long as it's clearly anonymized. Uh, we have, a, I'll give you another example of, uh, we, we've been asked if we could uh, make available uh, a list of specific experts, you know, so for example, who are the plutonium experts so that we can actually find these individuals. But from a security point of view, that's a real threat to aid to those individuals and to the industry. So on the one hand, yes, it makes sense. You want to be saying, yeah, these are the people you need to uh, go to who are the experts to tell you how to handle and manage material but then on the next side is well that's a security threat and we've been working with the MOD and uh, that's the Ministry of Defence in this particular area and we can only take advice on the uh, from the security uh, advisors about what we can and can't make available in terms of personal details but in terms of qualifications that we're looking for absolutely we can share them I don't think that's a problem at all. I suppose the only thing I will add to that is that this is a process which happens all across government. You know, this is the way that the UK government manages its records. So every branch of government has consultant reviewers who will come in. Usually they'll be retired civil servants. It, um, none of those names have been promoted because it's not an issue. Um, so I, I'm reluctant to make any commitments at this point purely because um, you know, this is not something which is required of us under the Public Records Act. You know, we, we sh nobody else makes the names available. So it's just something I'd want to go and look at before I made any commitment in a public forum. Yeah, I agree, Gordon. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, times, we are already at nine o'clock in the evening and maybe 12 o'clock <laughs> at noon. Yeah. There, yeah. so we are have to close the session now. But I have a very important question to ask. There was a question on chat saying that you will all share your slides with the participants later. Is it okay? Uh, so, yes, that should be. I, I'm happy okay. for the slides to be shared. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure if they'll be available. Well, the recording is going to be uploaded onto YouTube. Oh, yes, 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 I think so too. But my email address is there. If anybody wants the slides from, from myself or from Jenny or Gordon, contact me, Jenny or Gordon. They're all freely available. I, yeah. I think Martha and I can take care of sharing the slides with everybody. Okay. So that's settled. So we are now closing. And uh, 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 are you there, Martha? Oh, yes. yes. So <laughs> could you say uh, a few Thank words for so the closing? Yeah. So. Absolutely. No, I, I just want to thank everyone for a fantastic conversation. Um, really, really inspiring from a historian slash archivist point of view. It's interesting to see how um, sort of like day to day records management gets, you know, gets elevated to almost philosophical conversations. Because, you know, how do you preserve something for 10,000 years? It becomes really one of the big human questions and uh, so I would just yes um, encourage everyone um, to keep following uh, the work of the digital preservation coalition and the, the work of uh, the work of Elgan and of course to visit the nucleus I will definitely invite you all here and now um, to join us for the Elgan 2022 conference uh, which was supposed to happen uh, this year at nucleus but unfortunately um, it got postponed until 2022 when we will hopefully uh, for sure be able to, to travel freely. Um, so this invitation was really the, the only thing I wanted to say in conclusion. And yes, absolutely, we will share the slides. Um, the video will be made available. Uh, we, will be, we will be in touch and hopefully we will continue yeah. with the, uh, this conversation later on offline. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Marta. You, Marta. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just say to everybody, just please watch the developments over the coming years at the archive. We started this five years ago with nothing. We created the strategy, got the paper together, got the money together, and we've got an archive that cost over 25 million pounds, physically built. We're spending over 
just under 20 million pounds a year on this activity uh, and for, for the foreseeable future so please watch the developments going forward so hopefully you'll see the access arrangements improving over time and certainly next year early next when i say early mid-year next year the public website will be going live uh, we're just waiting for approval from the government to allow us to create a public website so you can see that there's a whole host of hurdles we have to go through in the covid environment as well so just watch this space uh, we're just at the start of the journey so please work with us as we move forward and feed in if we're doing something wrong please feed into us so we can actually do something about it where we can so thank you very much so thank you very much all thank the speakers thank you very much to everyone and much. all of the attendees <laughs> thank you so and um, Malta, could you tell me how to preserve the chat i uh it will be preserved automatically and i will uh, oh, okay. send it to you okay uh, thank I you will for now. it's always hard when we do things online because there's no okay. you know let's continue the conversation with coffee and cookies but just an abrupt leave um but yeah let me take that over and we we'll see we we'll see each other hopefully in person very soon bye bye okay thank you bye bye everybody thanks bye